All right, welcome to the podcast. I am joined today with Dr. Michael Cummings. We will be doing a deep dive on psychotic depression. I want to give a shout out to Kara Jacobson and James Swanson, awesome students who helped me with the write up that is on psychiatrypodcast.com. Um, you know, for every single episode, we do a detailed write up with citations, giving you more information than the actual episode contains. And I wanted to introduce this topic. We kind of jump around a little bit throughout the episode, and I wanted to give you kind of a big picture, kind of where we're going. Okay, and the first thing we talk about is the history of psychotic depression. We talk about the differential, and throughout the episode, we're talking about the differential, different types of issues that could look like depression with psychosis, but may actually have an alternative diagnosis and alternative treatment. For example, catatonia, you know, how do you differentiate catatonic depression, which could have a psychotic, which could have some psychotic symptoms as well from just a psychotic depression? How do you differentiate borderline personality disorder, which may have more dissociative psychotic events from psychotic depression? If they're bipolar with psychosis, they could have more mood incongruent psychotic features, meaning that they look depressed, but some of their psychotic thoughts are very grandiose or very like on a mission with a special purpose. So that that could give a hint at more of a bipolar type of illness, even if they don't have a history of mania, you know, they may just not have had that first manic episode. We're going to talk about, um, with psychotic depression, sometimes it's hard to differentiate delirium. In a delirium episode, you can have psychosis, you can be um, in a hypoactive delirium, you can look depressed, look down. And so we have to look at the history, the fluctuating course, you know, you have to look at the ability to focus, concentrate, draw a clock which um, someone with delirium will have a hard time doing. As well with psychotic depression, they may have a substance-induced psychosis. And we'll be talking about methamphetamines, how they can look psychotic depressed as well. Um, subsequently, we're going to be, throughout the episode, talking about things like BDNF, the HPA access, how that relates. And we're going to get into the treatment um, and just to kind of cue you in, you know, normal treatment might start with an antidepressant and antipsychotic um, if they have unipolar psychotic depression, right? In the outpatient setting, we're going to see maybe if that improves things. You know, if they're so sick to require hospitalization and they're not responding to an SSRI and a second generation antipsychotic, they may need electroconvulsive therapy. You know, determining on different factors in my sort of history of treating these patients, we may consider partial first or partial after ECT. And so, you know, partial hospitalization, five days a week, seven hours a day of group therapy, in my mind is considered an option. Uh, many of you will remember my episode 180 with Michael Garrett, where we do a deep dive on psychotherapy for psychosis. Interestingly, um, it, we did not get to talk too much about psychotherapy, but there was one study that I came through in preparing the article for this um, episode in which this one author looked at acceptance commitment therapy for psychotic depression, and they found that 44% of psychotic depression patients in the ACT group showed clinically significant improvement by discharge greater than two standard deviations change in the brief psychiatric rating scale compared to 0% in the enhanced treatment as usual group. So in the enhanced treatment as usual group, 0% of them showed two standard deviations or more change in the brief psychiatric rating scale, whereas in the acceptance commitment therapy group, about 44% did. That's pretty substantial. And so hopefully there's more research on psychotherapy for psychotic depression in the future. 
And um, we will also talk about, of course, there's always a role for exercise and diet. But as the severity increases, the likelihood of compliance to these things diminishes. Um, but, you know, psychotherapy, very pertinent for psychotic depression, especially to build that therapeutic alliance so that they get the treatment necessary to get out of this awful state of being. Okay, I'm looking forward to you getting any feedback on the episode. You can always send me a direct message on Instagram. I really appreciate those. Or on Twitter, you can tweet something about the episode. Tag me if you do, and I will appreciate reading that. Let's start the episode. All right, welcome back to the podcast. I am joined today with Dr. Michael Cummings, the beloved Dr. Michael Cummings. He is going to break down with me psychotic depression. This is a largely unrecognized and often untreated part of depression. It is underreported often by patients due to fear of potential consequences, reporting symptoms. You know, will they be hospitalized? Will there be embarrassment? And so they will not necessarily report the psychotic symptoms of their that are going on in their depression. Um, it also has a higher suicide rate, um, about twice that of just normal depression. And these are people that will have different treatment recommendations. Um, and there's actually about six to 25% of people with major depressive disorder that have psychotic illness. So today we're going to be doing a deep dive on it. We're going to be talking about different treatments for it. And so Dr. Cummings, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Very happy to be back. Um, and as you, indeed, as you point out, the estimates of uh, the frequency of psychotic depression uh, in the broader context of major depressive disorder is that it lies somewhere between 6 and 25 percent. The reason that range is, is such a broad estimate is um, most investigators in the field are aware that people underreport, and frankly, we don't know where the true number lies in that range, or maybe even above it. Let's talk about let's talk about the history of it. I always like to hear your hear your take on the history of it. And, okay, um, one of the yeah, indeed, one of the problems with research in this area has been that the field's definition of psychotic depression has changed over time. Uh, if you go back. Prior to DSM-3, psychotic depression was a term used to describe people whose illness included uh, melancholia, withdrawal, uh, and deterioration in function to the point that they weren't able to carry out the activities of daily living. These were the people who essentially curled up, took to bed, and if they weren't actively treated, were at risk of dying due to not eating and not drinking. They didn't necessarily have first rank psychotic symptoms. It was more a statement about the severity of their depression. That changed with um, DSM-3, which recognized that yes, there is a possibility for uh, such things as hallucinations and delusions as part of major depressive disorder. Uh, coming forward to the present, that has been refined to the point that now it, there's an awareness that in the DSM that psychosis does not reflect um, the severity of the major depressive disorder and that psychotic symptoms can occur in mild, moderate, or severe depression. Um, yeah. and, and while it does uh, alter the treatment and the prognosis and the suicide risk. Uh, currently, our understanding suggests that the psychosis is a separate trait uh, that the person may be vulnerable to, in addition to their vulnerability to becoming depressed. Yeah, I, I think that's that's especially important as you look at the age that the research was done, because if you're looking at like the DSM-2 age, of the research, it's more severity, the worst end of the spectrum. You might be also seeing some catatonic patients thrown in there. DSM three, it's really um, that's when the, the the requirement for hallucinations, delusions, depressive stupor was there. Um, and then DSM four, you have this uh, 
it's a, it's a severe subtype with delusions, hallucinations, and then with DSM-5, the severity of the depression itself is not as important. And I almost wonder with that, if the DSM-5 potentially captures more of like the borderline personality disorder with the sort of quasi-psychotic symptoms that sometimes go on with it. Uh, yes. One of the things that has occurred over time is a recognition that psychotic symptoms per se uh, can occur in a wide range of disorders, um, you know, in, in addition to the primary psychotic disorders like schizophrenia, um, people, of course, who are bipolar can be psychotic. Uh, even anxiety disorders are associated occasionally with psychotic symptoms. Uh, for example, PTSD with psychosis uh, has been reported and described. Uh, and some geneticists think that indeed there may be uh, a heritable vulnerability to psychosis that is somewhat independent of whatever else the person may be vulnerable to in terms of, of mental illness. Um, and to some extent, that's supported by the fact that uh, in broad population surveys, mostly again in Scandinavia, because they have birth to death, uh, you know, medical care and registries, about half of the healthy population if you ask them, have you had any of the following symptoms ever, about half of people will say yes, that they have at times hallucinated visually or auditorily, or uh, they've had a um, troubling persecutory thought they couldn't get out of their mind for a few days. Um, and these are people who do not have a mental illness per se, uh, because they ultimately don't, you know, their life is not um, impacted by the psychotic symptom and usually they're transient um so we're i think we're moving toward seeing psychosis as a dimension or subcomponent and of that may be there in a variety of illnesses but uh, certainly true in major depressive disorder um and indeed dsm-5 permits uh, a diagnosis of psychosis in the context of things like dysthymic disorder or what what was termed in the research diagnostic criteria, minor depressive disorder. So again, showing a dissociation between severity and the presence or absence of psychosis. Yeah, I think I think that in my own mind, I've always, and maybe maybe this needs to be shifted, but I've always seen uh, depression with psychosis as like the depression gets worse and worse and worse. And then they have the psychotic symptoms come and as the severity increases. Um, and I differentiate that in my mind versus someone with borderline personality disorder who can sometimes have these sort of quasi psychotic episodes, dissociative episodes. Um, and in my mind, those are like the two big categories I see inpatient, right? It's like depression with psychotic features, one category, borderline personality disorder with some psychotic features or yeah and i'm wondering how you if if you see it like that if you see it a little bit differently my view has shifted over time i i'm coming around to the idea that indeed psychotic symptoms per se can occur in a broader range of both severities and in a broader range of illnesses than we've tended to think of them um it certainly is true i think the more severe the illness, the more likely it becomes that the person will have persisting psychotic symptoms. Um, but I've had, I've run across a few patients over time who um, confided after they got to know me that, uh, yes, they have had a persisting auditory hallucination or visual hallucination. And these were people who were not that sick. They were not in need of hospitalization they were functioning they were going about their business um and to some extent they had adapted to the presence of the psychotic symptom um so i'm i'm less rigid about the severity psychosis relationship than they used to be okay well like let's talk a little bit about like what the types of um psychotic symptoms are 
Like okay. if, if, if we're trying to differentiate, for example, someone with PTSD, like the psychotic symptoms may be more in line with the trauma, right? Yes. Um, uh, they're often, uh, in the case of like PTSD, it may be a spillover um, of the, you know, the dissociation that can occur with a flashback, for example, um, or the avoidance of certain situations, they get very difficult to distinguish at times from, is this person just having a brief dissociation? Or if there's a residual suspiciousness or unreasonable attitude about a circumstance or situation, I mean, how much is that sort of stretching the boundary of not being reality based? Because that, as it, part of psychosis, just means that the person is not accurately engaging in reality testing. They're responding to something as if it were true, when objectively it is not. Um, and that can range, of course, everything from an overvalued idea to an overt delusion or in the case of um, perceptual disturbance it can be anything from a tendency to misperceive something all the way to fully evolved multimodal hallucinatory experiences uh, which i've seen some flashbacks in ptsd patients who indeed they during the flashback they were exhibiting multimodal um sensory misinterpretation of their environment and indeed in talking about it afterward no they were they said no i was back where the trauma occurred um and you know the people had changed to different people the surroundings had changed to a different place um so it was yeah. you know, a it substantial sounds, substantial departure from reality it sounds like a, a dream a dream a nightmare because i know in ptsd nightmares Mm -hmm. not a direct copy of the actual trauma over and over again. Nightmares will be slight variations uh, yes. of the trauma. Mm -hmm. um, one of the signs of malingering is that it's always an exact copy of the trauma, according to my malingering textbook. <laughs> Correct yes. me if I'm wrong. No, that, that, is, that is accurate. Malingerers want to sell the story and will say that it's always the same, whereas people who actually experience... Uh, flashbacks or psychotic symptoms, they morph over time, uh, depending on what's happening. The dreams of PTSD also change over time and circumstances. Um, and indeed, in major depression, uh, for a long time, the field has considered mood congruent and mood incongruent psychotic signs and symptoms, as you, as you might guess, or as you know, uh, mood congruent simply means the hallucinated experience or the delusional belief is consistent with the signs and symptoms of depression, things like excessive guilt, um, negative rumination that goes beyond the boundaries of reality, uh, holding beliefs about being guilty for things that the person can't be responsible for. And then the person may have mood incongruent psychotic symptoms as, as well. I think one of the other things that's happened to the field is in DSM-5, there's a recognition that uh, the person may have major depressive disorder with mixed features, meaning they have some features that would be more consistent with mood elevation, um, but they don't meet the criteria for being hypomanic or manic. Uh, I think that reflects that we're also learning that there's not as sharp a break between major depressive disorder and perhaps bipolar spectrum illness as we once thought there was. There is some crossover, which going all the way back to the basics to genetics, when people have looked at the vulnerability genes for major depression and the vulnerability genes for uh, bipolar mood disorder, uh, a fair number of the loci that have been identified overlap. So in, in some ways, it would be kind of silly to think that these, the phenotypic illness is going to be entirely separated from each other. Right. So, okay. So let's talk about, let's go a little bit deeper into the mood congruent psychotic features versus mood incongruent. Because I think 
like actually talking about what they might be mm -hmm. might might be helpful. So like the mood congruent with depression. So it might be like personal inadequacy, guilt. I have some disease. I'm close to death or I'm dead. There may be some nihilistic mm -hmm. piece. Yeah, my I, my organs are turning to dust. So um I'm or I'm, I deserve punishment. Yeah. Um, uh, for example, I had one um individual I interviewed recently, he's 23. Uh, and he believes he was responsible for World War II, which, of course, um, the U.S.'s entry into World War II was 82 years ago, so he can not be responsible for that. But he believes he is. Right. So it's like I created this awful thing, right? Yes. I, yes. Um, so it's the, so that's mood congruent. Mood incongruent may be, um, may be areas where they are it's almost like they're defending against the depression itself. Like the depression gets so severe and so horrible that these psychotic symptoms keep them from experiencing the full extent of the nihilistic hell that they start to see the world through. Um, yes. So they may think like, you know, I have a, I'm, I'm on a special mission or I'm, you know, I'm a king or I'm a queen of England, you know, like, or like start, like, go ahead. You tell me what some common art that you. Oh, yes. Uh, well, we have several people who believe that they are some form of deity. Uh, we have some people also who indeed, as you allude to, believe that they're either incredibly wealthy and own everything or um, they're in some ways all powerful, even though they'll turn right around and tell you that because of their depression, they can't literally can't get out of bed. Um, so uh, things that are incongruent with uh, indeed a depressed nihilistic outlook. Now, when would you say that's just an, a, a deflated narcissist who's now depressed or someone who's like having a psychotic symptom that seems grandiose or some of these hypomanic defenses are in that, you know? Uh, again, when it when it reaches the point where it has clearly moved beyond reality testing, that is, um, the person is claiming things that evidence is ample to would disprove to anybody who was uh, able to test reality. Uh, and in fact, I've had uh very depressed patients tell me that they literally were multi-billionaires and in virtually the same breath uh, acknowledged that they didn't have any money so, <laughs> so, so what is that is that um insight into that they're not a billionaire or is that uh no 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 they'll turn right around and say no but i really am a billionaire i just don't happen to have any money right now okay. the money's somewhere else or some under someone else's control or it's being inappropriately taken from them um some projective defenses there in terms of um somebody else has made all of this happen yeah i would say with the deflated narcissist you're getting also the story of someone who is narcissistic maybe they inflated prior mm -hmm. to the event prior to the depression and then they go into the depression when they're not matching up to this sort of idealized self that they had created. And then um, the, the psychotic, like the psycho whereas psychosis is like, yeah, like you're saying, they have very little insight mm -hmm. into the reality in a psychotic yeah. event. Yeah, one of the, one of the things that uh, research has established about mood incongruent delusions in particular is that that's often a tip-off that you may not be looking at major depressive disorder you may be looking at somebody who's bipolar um about somewhere between a third and a half of the people who have mood incongruent delusions at some point later go on to have a hypomanic or manic episode um 
and indeed uh, one of the things to watch out for is people who start having depressive episodes early in life recurrent episodes and who may have mood in incongruent features in their depression you may be looking at a budding bipolar patient who just hasn't had their first hypomanic or manic episode yet that's good okay so if so that's a good clinical pearl if you see someone with mood incongruent so they're they're depressed the depression has been maybe progressive but now they're having mood incongruent psychotic symptoms mm -hmm. Like yeah. your, your suspicion for bipolar, even if they haven't had a manic episode, goes up. Yeah. You put it on your index of suspicion that this may be an undiscovered bipolar patient. The other clue in that pharmacologically is if you put them on an antidepressant and they initially appear to get better in terms of depressed mood, energia, anhedonia, but then it goes a little too far and they start to become irritable, a little overactive, maybe a little hypersexual. Um, you may be, the antidepressant may be moving them toward their first hypomanic or manic episode. Yeah. What, like when you say hypersexual, what kind of symptoms would you be seeing or what kind of behaviors would be see, you be seeing? Um they somebody who is normally not that social begins overtly flirting with a lot of people um somebody who maybe has had a steady girlfriend or boyfriend suddenly starts being interested in going out with multiple people um and other you know with related areas of impulsivity uh, people who've normally been fairly thrifty start spending in money impulsively, that kind of thing. In other words, they're not yet overtly manic or hypomanic, but they're doing things that are atypical for that individual. Okay. And what, when you're, so I'm thinking we're continuing to try to assess um, the diagnostic categories. When would you be more suspecting that this is borderline personality disorder? Uh, when the mood is, rather than being um, consistently depressed, uh, the person's mood is very labile and very responsive to social interaction. You know, one of, one of the characteristics in major depressive disorder is as the person's depression worsens, they become essentially less and less mood reactive. Um, you know, the, at the severest end of uh, major depressive disorder, the person is largely unresponsive to any events in terms of feeling better or having any hedonic capability. But with a borderline individual, their mood depends on what happened in the last few minutes. <laughs> uh, these are the people who may be um, horribly depressed and elated and that may happen several times between breakfast and lunch, depending on who they've interacted with and how things went. Uh, I tend to think of um, borderline personality disorder, indeed, as a mood disorder, but as one characterized by um, mood liability and mood intensity rather than um, a consistent elevation or consistent depression of mood. Yeah. So with borderline precise, we also look at like social veneer, right? So when they're around certain types of people, they can really kind of glue it back together most of the yeah. time. Yes. Um, social veneer, but they'll have these quasi psychotic episodes that are kind of dissociative in quality. What can you, can you give any sort of like um, details on what kind of psychotic episodes they might have? Usually, uh, usually they are time limited. And usually they are focused on um, a misinterpretation of an interaction with another specific person. They may become paranoid about, you know, a particular person transiently. Oh, that person's plotting to get me. They're out to harm me. Um, and but when you talk with them about it at the core of it, there usually is some real conflict. 
but they've distorted it um, beyond all recognition. Uh, that may become jumbled up with dissociative elements as well, so that um, I had one borderline patient who, when she was really distressed and would have a psychotic break, she believed that her coworkers were being controlled by her mother who had been dead for years. And that would last until she calmed down, and then she would go, oh, that's not true. That's silly. You can, you can see where this is complex because I mean, it's like you have to have the big picture with borderline personality disorder. Mm -hmm. um, I would also say in my experience of treating these patients inpatient, depression with psychosis, it takes longer to treat. They don't have a flight to health on day two and three of their hospitalization. No, no. The person with major depressive disorder um does not suddenly look well. It often takes them weeks or months to appear well. Um, and that's one of the differences in, in psychotic depression. Pharmacologically, they don't typically respond to antidepressant treatment alone. Um, I think the response rate for antidepressants in the psychotically depressed is down in the 20 to 30% range, very low. If you add an antipsychotic to that, uh, you'll get response rates that are more typical of what you see with antidepressants in general. You'll get a response rate up around two thirds. Um, yeah. So you're saying just an antidepressant does not treat someone with depression with psychosis very well? Typically, no. Uh, the treatments basically fall into two camps. You have an antidepressant with an antipsychotic. Or in the most severe cases, you have ECT. Uh, there has been some work done with looking at transcranial magnetic stimulation, vagal nerve stimulation. Um, frankly, for these patients, those treatments have been less than impressive at this point. Okay, so there was a recent larger study by Eck Strand at all mm -hmm. from the department um, in Sweden and uh, at Lund, Lund University. And this was a study of uh, 186 inpatients who did not have a primary psychotic disorder, meaning they didn't have primarily like schizophrenia, but they did have depression. So I think they, they could have depression with psychosis, okay? Mm -hmm and they received either ketamine or ECT. Mm -hmm. And they found that with ECT, 63% went into remission. With ketamine, 46% went into remission. Yes. Um, when looking specifically at the group that had psychotic depression, with ECT, 79% went into remission. With ketamine, 50%. Yes. They put yeah. the, the P value was 0 0.15. So in mm -hmm. the, in the paper, they said this was clinically insignificant. I, I read it as no, I think it's just a small sample size, but I would definitely, the effect size was significant enough for me to put ECT above ketamine at ECT for this group had 2.3 effect size, whereas ketamine was 1.4. Yes. Uh, I think had they indeed had they had a larger sample they would have achieved statistical significance rather than uh, most people would interpret that as a statistical trend toward the superiority of ECT. But uh, um, my own experience has been that for psychotic depression, particularly if it is also a severe depression, ECT is far and away the most effective treatment we have. There was another study that looked at ketamine versus ECT that um, looked at outpatients and they specifically excluded patients with depression with psychosis. And uh, this this was a study, Anand et al., um, 2023. You know this, you're mm -hmm. familiar with this one? Yes. So I don't think this ketamine is as helpful for this topic that we currently have. Um, well, one of, one of the, you know, the, advantage of ketamine and esketamine is 
both are very rapidly effective uh, in treating depression and in reversing suicidal suicidality. Ketamine and esketamine, though, are both dissociative um, anesthetics, basically. And to an extent, they are psychotomimetic. That is, they induce psychotic symptoms over time. Uh, one of the limitations with ketamine has been that you know, the initial antidepressant response tends to wear off over several days to about a week. Um, but if you keep giving people ketamine repeatedly, the length or the duration of the benefit gets shorter and shorter. Mm -hmm. And the degree of dissociative and psychotic symptoms gets bigger and bigger, uh, which I think has been a limitation. Um, for the use of ketamine as an ongoing treatment. I think for many people, it may be, perhaps not for those with active psychosis, but for many people, it may be an excellent way to sort of get things started in terms of treating their depression. But it it has both ketamine and esketamine have limitations in terms of ongoing treatment. I think um, one of the thoughts that I had in reading the study was the the amount of ketamine that they gave was like 0. 0.5, which mm -hmm. I've heard in clinical practice, they go all the way up to like one, 1. 1.2, which is a very strong dissociative experience yeah. at that, at that dose. It's a, it's a full dissociation usually. Oh, I know what I was going to say about that first study though. They, the, the older adults had a higher remission rate with ECT than the compared to the younger group. And I wonder if it's because the older patients who are depressed it's kind of like that depression with psychosis tends to to flare more in the older group and what i would see in the hospital i don't know if you have any thoughts on that it certainly is true i think the response to major depressive disorder does change over time um older people at least in my experience tend to have more resistant illness um and some of the research I've read suggests that in some cases at least, or at least in some samples, that these people may have had numerous subclinical episodes of depression or dysphoria before they finally blossomed into a, you know, a fully evolved major depressive episode at an older age with the longer duration of perhaps subclinical depression incurring some degree of treatment resistance in them. Our understanding of treatment resistance in depression has focused largely on the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Those people who have a chronically elevated cortisol tend to be those who are resistant to antidepressant medications. Um, as, as illustrated by the fact that if you give them Mifepristone at 200 milligrams a day for five or six days, you can get a fairly high remission rate in um, people with um, depression who have been refractory to multiple antidepressants and to ECT. Uh, now, unfortunately, you can't continue to give people Mifepristone because you'll put them into Addisonian crisis. But it does suggest that if you block their cortisol, they suddenly regain their responsiveness to uh, antidepressant medications. Uh, again, pointing to an abnormal HPA axis as tending to be perhaps the source of at least one source of treatment resistance in major depressive disorder. Okay, so we talked about HPA axis. Is there any other things that kind of come to your mind as potential mechanisms of? Uh, yeah, if you look at well. If you start with the very basics in terms of frontotemporal metabolism and people with major depressive disorder, there's about a 20 to 40% decline in um, glucose uptake and utilization in the frontotemporal areas. Uh, there is a loss of dendritic arborization. They, you know, they're, well, the dendritic trees on their neurons do look like a bush in wintertime rather than spring. Um, it's lost the spines and the connections, and um, there's 
it's easy to imagine that loss of interneuronal connections, if it becomes severe enough, can lead start to lead to um, outright dysfunction and um, errors in both processing of uh, sensory information and errors in terms of reality testing. Um, so that you know the uh, it's very likely that the that sort of, those sort of atrophic changes may underlie some of the uh, psychosis that's observed. I recently saw like this clip on on YouTube of someone saying, "We have no idea why depression happens. You know, there's no biomarkers in the brain." Um, and are you telling me, Doctor Cummings, that well, that's just actually, nonsense? <laughs> there are actually brain changes with depression. Like, are you telling yes. me that? On autopsy, people who died of severe depression had a, have actual brain changes. Yes, yes, they exhibit a thinner cortex, uh, loss of dendritic arborization, decreased metabolic rates. Um, you know, and then you know to go back to our understanding of major depression in the 1950s, we simplistically thought that oh. People are depressed because they have a deficit in monoamines, serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine. I think our view of this has evolved to say, no, they have a primary problem with their frontal control over limbic structures and the abnormalities we're seeing in their, their modulatory uh, molecules is more an effect than a cause. Um, you know, the the modulatory areas are working hard to try to get the thing to work and it gets further and further from homeostasis. Um, <clears throat> but no, there are real changes in the brain um, uh, during major depression. And unfortunately, um, when the person remits from major depression, especially the first episode, um, those largely recover. Uh, now, if somebody's had recurring episodes of major depression, it gets harder for the brain to get all the way back to baseline, which is why, you know, now we recommend that if somebody's had recurring episodes of depression, maybe they should stay on an antidepressant rather than being tapered off. It used to be that every time somebody would recover from a major depressive episode, they'd get tapered off their antidepressant. And... That certainly still makes sense for somebody who's had a single episode, but if somebody's up to their third episode of major depression, they may need ongoing treatment. Yeah, or and and usually usually multiple types of treatment: exercise, diet, therapy. Yeah, exercise, diet, cognitive behavioral therapy, other therapies. Um, and in fact, that's one of the areas where cognitive behavioral therapy has an advantage in that, you know, when you stop taking a medication, five half-lives and it's gone. Uh, people who learn cognitive behavioral therapy um, can continue to practice it on their own after they've stopped having sessions. So in that sense, they get a um, an added benefit. Okay, so so in summary, yes, the brain does change with depression. <laughs> um, we actually did a really nice dive on this. Episode 155 is depression, a chemical imbalance. We talk about all of the things that we know about depression um, being much more, it's it's much more nuanced than the chemical imbalance theory. Um, there are changes in the brain itself. And we know also people who have brain issues like frontal temporal degeneration depression is much higher uh people with different types of diseases like huntington's parkinson's have much higher rates of depression strokes have mm -hmm. much higher rates of depression um and so there's this sort of crossover there and um yeah anything else you want to say on this before we yeah just that the you know the the frontotemporal area of the brain we tend to think of the limbic system in terms of mood but you know it's highly involved in everything from memory to essentially energy balance and manipulation for the human being as a whole which is why so many things go wrong when somebody becomes depressed it, depression is 
much broader than simply having a sad mood. Um, in fact, one of my distinctions between sadness and depression is, you know, if you're feeling sad about something, the sadness will typically motivate you to do something about it, change something. People who become depressed become paralyzed by their depression. Um, that's where they often asking people if they have feelings of helplessness and hopelessness. That's how that's a relevant clinical question. Okay. Coming back to um, so with the psychotic depression question, are, are there unique brain changes findings with psychotic depression that are not in other types of depression? There seems to be in psychotic depression and there's, there are a limited number of uh, PET studies that have tried to look at this, and it, there appears to be a greater disturbance or decrease in the metabolism for the, particularly the dominant temporal lobe um, in psychotic depression. Um, and in some ways that makes since uh, in primary psychotic illnesses, we think that uh, in particular, the non-dominant temporal lobe is often the source for positive psychotic symptoms such as delusional thoughts or uh, hallucinations. Uh, and it would make sense that another illness that affects the same area could also produce those sorts of symptoms. Yeah, you, you sent me a nice article on BDNF and mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about BDNF and depression. Yes. Uh, one of the hallmarks in, in major depressive disorder um, is that there is a huge fall off in brain derived neurotrophic factor. Um, neurons are such highly specialized cells that frankly, they don't do a very good job of even caring for their own metabolism they depend largely on glial cells to um, do everything except transmit information and uh, in major depressive disorder there is a dysfunction of those support networks um, so that uh, things like uh, brain derived neurotrophic factor glial cell derived neurotrophic factor and endothelial derived neurotrophic factor all decline steeply during a major depressive episode. Um, and indeed, one of the one of the things that you see in response to that is the decrease in metabolic rate and the loss of dendritic arborization that we were referring to. When the person responds to an antidepressant treatment, whether that's ECT or an antidepressant medication or cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, you see a corresponding rise in neurotrophic factors and a uh, essentially a sprouting of new dendrite, dendritic spines and a reconnection and an uptick in metabolic rate. And so it, it li literally is a case of having depressed metabolism as well as a depressed mood. Yeah. We also know exercise increases BDNF. Yes. Specifically vigorous exercise. Yeah, specifically aerobic exercise, things that get your heart rate up, make you breathe um, more rapidly. Yeah, so the the BDNF is is kind of like one of these things that we know is decreased in post-mortem brains of depressed patients. And it's one of those things that changes with treatment, whether it's... Mm -hmm. Uh, medications, therapy, exercise. Um, yeah. Uh, well, the nice thing is now, in addition to the post-mortem studies, they're also able using uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Uh, you can actually see the changes in people who are living. Uh, so it's not a, a it's not a post-mortem of artifact of some sort. I wonder what you think about. Um, you talked briefly about TMS. Um, I'm actually about to do a big TMS episode. Mm -hmm. What do you think of like the SAINT protocol for this type of patient, for the psychotic depressed patient? SAINT protocol in general. You you know what I'm talking about coming out of Stanford. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, I think the SAINT protocol is, is, is reasonable. And, and 
I don't think we're using TMS as widely perhaps as we should as an augmenting strategy for either antidepressants or in some cases as, as a standalone treatment. Uh, most of the data I've seen regarding specifically psychotic depression doesn't suggest that TMS is going to be a highly effective modality for people who are psychotically depressed. Um, it may still be a very useful adjunct, however. I, I haven't seen enough data to make up my mind on that. Okay, so we've talked about mechanism. Anything else you want to tie into the mechanism? Um, just that uh, basically the more we can do to once somebody has remitted from depression, mm -hmm. uh, there are often a number of lifestyle changes they need to make to help safeguard themselves against future depression. Because unfortunately, one of the truths about major depressive disorder is that every time somebody has an episode, psychotic or not, it makes the next one more probable. One differential I think that's important to, to, to put out there is a delirium. Because you can have a consult for depression in the, in the hospital. Like, oh, this person's really depressed. They're not talking. They have all these you know, awful things that they believe about themselves. And there can be an aspect of psychosis, like, oh, they, you know, they're saying they did these horrible things in the past, some some of which are like, you know, completely unreasonable, maybe. And then you go see the patient and, you know, they have this waxing and waning ability to focus and concentrate. One minute they're pulling out the lines, maybe the next minute they just look really stuporous. So mm -hmm. th this is this is a patient with a medical issue as well. Maybe they have a urinary tract infection. Maybe they have a upper respiratory tract infection. So they're in the hospital for something else sometimes like post hip fracture repair. So yeah, tell me about delirium and how it could look like psychotic depression. And okay. The, well, one of the truisms about major depressive disorder is it typically has a long prodromal period and is very rarely abrupt in onset, whereas delirium represents essentially a loss of the brain's normal physiologic state. It's been insulted by a major um, insult, either inflammatory or uh, metabolic, and brain function abruptly deteriorates uh, with, as you point out, a fluctuating level of arousal. Uh, the person may be alert and lucid at one moment, and the next they're confused and disoriented and not making much sense, and then they'll come back. And uh, uh, it's something that we need to keep on a very high on an index of suspicion, particularly in hospital settings. When they've done surveys specifically looking for delirium in hospitals, they find that the rate in inpatients is right around 40%. Mm -hmm. um, because people indeed have, they've come in for an infection, they've come in for a procedure, and they get missed as being delirious because the vast majority of people with delirium are just quietly delirious for a day or two and then they get better. Uh, there are people though that don't get better because their delirium is being driven by an ongoing disturbance or their brain was fragile to begin with, particularly if they're older and maybe at the beginnings of uh, a neurocognitive disorder, it's very easy for those people to become delirious. So it's something we should always be thinking about. And it's one of the arguments for always in everybody doing um, a careful mental status exam and if possible, observe the person over time. So I would, I would say there's a, there's a saying, if you're consulted on a patient in the hospital, delirium until proven otherwise, <laughs> you know, have them draw a clock. The clocks will not yes. be normal. In someone with delirium someone with delirium will never draw a nice clock with the right time uh no if they do that you're uh, and if they can do it more than once then they're not a delirious person I, I always um when i would cover for cnl i would have um the residents and medical students always bring me a clock for every patient i just love to look at them mm -hmm. and and lo and and sometimes they would they'd be like i don't know why this person <laughs> 
this clock is so awful. They just have depression. I'm like, let's go talk to him. Like, no, this, <laughs> this, this is delirium. Yes. This is delirium. Um, okay. So because think about it, like, would you ever do ECT on someone with delirium? Probably not, right? Probably not, because the, the treatment for delirium is to correct whatever the underlying cause of the delirium is. Now, unfortunately, the the potential causes for delirium are, are a legion. Uh, certainly in, in an acute care hospital, the vast majority, probably the most common, is post-surgical delirium, uh, which in, in most cases is a response to the anesthesia. Those are those people get missed because they get better fairly quickly. Um, but if you actually examine them right after they come out of recovery, they're often having things like hallucination. Um, indeed, I talked with one patient who, he sounded on superficially okay until he started doing mental status exam and he couldn't quite spell world, either forward or backward. He couldn't really count backwards. And while we were talking, he keeps looking out the window and asking, well, what are you, what are you looking at? Because as far as I was aware, there wasn't anything outside the special. And he tells me, oh, there's a, there's a large pterodactyl that keeps circling the building. Okay, now. <laughs> okay, um, here's, a, here's a recent one for me. This was a family case. It's not a patient case. Uh, you know, so person, 60 years old, gets admitted to the hospital. Um. They, they've had a, a chronic Foley, so they, they, they're having some issue with urinations. So they have this thing stuck in there for a long time, and, and they've been acting depressed and psychotic in the hospital, right? Mm -hmm. So I hear that, and I immediately think, UTI, delirium, check for, you know. And so I, I, I tell the um, my friend this, who told me this. And lo and behold, yes, the person does have a UTI. And, you know, so I'm like, okay, get that, get that catheter out, right? The catheter is a nidus of infection. Until you get that catheter out, they're going to stay infected, treat them from the UTI. And, and the next thing I'm hearing is that the psychiatrist on wants to do ECT. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> was this person uh, no. depressed? <laughs> was this person depressed before? <laughs> Um, they went into the hospital like a month ago where they had depressed like two weeks before the hospital. Um, am I missing something here? Is the, is the, is the person catatonic and I'm just not seeing the full picture? Of course, you know, like I can't see that this isn't my patient, you know, but let's clear the UTI, let's clear the infection and let's see if that resolves it. Yes. Rather than jumping to ECT. That's, that would be my sense. Yeah, certainly in an elderly person in the hospital who becomes delirious, always check the lungs and the bladder. Um, those are the two most likely sources of an infection giving rise to delirium. Um, I usually just go from the head all the way down to the feet is the way mm -hmm. that I think about it. So yes. in every single organ system, so head, are they having a stroke? Are they having, you know, a really bad sinus infection, something in the face, chest, are they having lung infection, you know, pulmonary embolism, like anything that would cause a big disruption in the chest. Usually it's the infection, St you know, stomach, are there for some reason, mm -hmm. some, you know, uh, diverticulitis maybe, or some sort of bladder infection, you know, yeah. And then, and then go all the way down to the legs. You know, if they have some like large, you know, let's say they have diabetes and they have some infected toe that's unresolved or necrotic mm -hmm. appendage. Um, so yeah, I, I, with the residents, I would usually just go down the body, just a, a quick way of kind of seeing what's there. And you will be called on these patients if you're a psychiatrist and the team will have missed the medical issue because all they see is this person looks psychotic. Yeah. Call, call psychiatry. Yeah. They look psychotic. They're confused. They're often behaviorally disturbed because they're responding to a reality different from everyone else's. Um, and yeah, they think they, Oh, it's a mental disorder. No, it's a delirium um, until proven otherwise. Okay. So differential, we have 
we talked about borderline personality disorder. We talked about delirium. We talked a little bit about bipolar, if they, especially mm -hmm. if they have atypical features. I don't know if there's any. I think, I think that the, you know, hearing the family history, is there a family history of bipolar? Is um, can you get collateral? Because often, if patients are very psychotic, you will not be able to understand the course of the illness until you talk to the family members. What happened first? What happened second? What happened third? Yes, indeed. Um, you know, psychiatric diagnoses depend more than almost more than anything else on longitudinal history. How has the illness behaved? Uh, the other differential I would throw in here for somebody you're just seeing who is appears depressed and psychotic is are they, um, do they have a substance use disorder? Mm. Uh, these days I see a lot of people um, in forensic settings who initially presented as depressed and psychotic because they've been using massive amounts of methamphetamine, which did a nice job of producing a, a, a dopamine depletion state, which looks like a psychotic depression. You know, okay, so how these patients usually look impatient to me is they're sleeping most of the day or they're angry at the staff. And they'll go from being very angry to like sleeping. And then when you interview them, it's the only patient that I'm like, I tell the medical students and residents, they continue to escalate in their anger if they've been crashing off meth. So short interviews, please, if they're getting more angry, do not continue to try to talk to them. You know? uh, no, yeah, give them a break and come back later and gather your interview in pieces. What is the psychotic symptoms unique to meth? Uh, it tends to, in, tends to induce most often a um, persecutory delusional system. They may or may not hallucinate, but they are very often quite paranoid initially. You know, one of the effects of increased dopamine in the brain is to uh, make the person hypervigilant and that typically if they're a heavy user that will spill over into overt paranoia yeah, but it's usually not a very usually not a very well formed or elaborated delusional system it's more like well things are dangerous people might, might be out to get me but you know it's kind of quasi vague it's it's not a detailed story of you know, the FBI has been following me for three years and I, I've been seeing people here and there. And um, it, It's a more free-floating global paranoia, often, as you point out, associated with irritability. Um, do, you, do you find that they're paranoid crashing off meth? Because usually, okay, so you'll see them in the, in the hospital, in the ER, maybe hopped up on meth. Right. And that could look different than like day two, day three, day four in the psychiatric hospitalization. Do you see it? Describe that. Yeah. I, well, I, yeah, most people who use methamphetamine acutely, they look, if anything, somewhat manic and paranoid. And they're, you know, they're agitated, they're hyperverbal, they're, they exhibit um, essentially flight of ideas, persecutory ideation. They're, very prone to becoming violent. If they are a chronic user, they may induce essentially a settled psychosis that may take a while to resolve. You know, we are, uh, I work in a forensic setting where we often get them a few months after their last meth use. By the time we get them, they appear most often dysphoric. Um, still have abnormal sleep, although they are now sleeping. Um, and they may have persisting psychotic symptoms, usually this sort of free-floating paranoia and uh, sometimes occasionally hallucination, but not very often. Uh, those people often will go on to recover completely out once they're off the methamphetamine long enough, albeit they usually also get treated with some antipsychotic medication along the way to dampen the symptoms my um, my counter trans my like what i feel from someone who's like day four day five is often like a just 
lack of joy, lack of pleasure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, they're as I said, they're dopamine depleted. And if you have no dopamine, you're not going to feel very good. Okay. So we have that this this is really good. Meth induced psychosis differential because they look they will look pleasureless, but and they'll have this sort of vague psychosis. Um anger maybe so that's one the other thing i would i would want to differentiate is like schizophrenia with depression because sometimes mm-hmm. it's it's the negative symptoms versus maybe the antipsychotics are very blunting can you speak yeah. to that one of the things people are sometimes not careful enough about with antipsychotics is to be sure they're not pushing the drug beyond the drug's point of futility um, that is to concentrations that are beyond the drug's therapeutic range, because you can, particularly with the more potent dopamine antagonists, induce something that is very much like a dopamine depletion state where the person is anergic, anhedonic. Um, They look very negative, withdrawn, um, and it's essentially excessive dopamine blockade. we use the antipsychotics in hospital settings for two things. One is acutely to decrease agitation, and the other is to treat psychosis. Pushing the drug above its therapeutic range does not make does not treat the psychosis any better or faster. Um, that was a you know rapid neuroleptization was at one point in psychiatry a theory. Uh, when they finally got a large-scale study done comparing very early high-dose neuroleptics versus just starting at a uh, a typical therapeutic dose, um, absolutely no difference in the in the response rate of the psychosis or the time course of the response. Uh, so that that was a, a theory that's been long since debunked. People sometimes conflate acute control of agitation with treatment of psychosis. They're not the same thing. Um, You can treat agitation with an antipsychotic, that is, particularly ones that are also antihistaminic, you can make people sleep, Um, but you're not going to make them less psychotic faster by giving them more and more antipsychotic to the point that you're overdosing them on the antipsychotic. And indeed, you can induce this sort of uh, this dopamine depletion state where they will look very negative, very withdrawn. Yeah, just like someone with Parkinson's, they, they'll be less reactive in their face, their emotionality. Um, and so it's the time course, right? It's for, yes. for, for someone with that, you would get, you would have to get collateral, you would have to know when the medication was started Mm -hmm. a lot of outpatient care is finding the right dose it's also a a place to advocate for measurement of plasma concentrations um the nice thing is we now have a fairly good understanding of the antipsychotic effects of dopamine antagonists and their relative concentration range and for example if you were treating somebody say with uh, olanzapine zyprexa um, there is no point in pushing the drug above 150 nanograms per milliliter at 150 nanograms per milliliter the receptor occupancy of olanzapine is right around 83 percent If you wanted to push that up to 85%, because the receptor occupancy curve has become so flat by 150 nanograms per mil, you'd have to give the person, you'd have to get them up to around 400 nanograms per milliliter to get from 83 to 85% receptor occupancy. You know, so pushing them up to 250 or 300 nanograms per milliliter makes no sense. You're not helping them. All you're doing is increasing their side effect burden. For the more more potent dopamine antagonists like haloperidol or fluflunazine, uh, haloperidol 
essentially saturates the D2 receptors at about 18 nanograms per milliliter. Flufenazine gets there by about four nanograms per milliliter. Well, there's no point in going further because you can't occupy more than 100% of something. But you can produce adverse effects in other systems. Also, for those who are interested, episode 127, Jonathan Meyer came on and talked about antipsychotic plasma levels. He has a nice book on this as well. Um, mm -hmm. and on, in the website, we cite the uh, the uh, Dr. Cummings and at the Patton State Hospital, their blood levels that they're looking for for each antipsychotic. Indeed, also mentioned that there, there are books on the same topic. Jonathan's is certainly the most comprehensive that I've seen. Yeah. So... Um, so, okay, so schizophrenia, you know, are are we over-treating with an antipsychotic? That's part of the differential. I always I always think it's wise as psychiatrists to think, are we doing this to the patient, you know, and not, mm -hmm. and, and to kind of have the humility to consider and look at the time course, right? The time course will tell you if, if you are doing it, like the dose was increased, from this dose to a huge dose, this dose, and then the person looked more flat, more depressed. It's like, okay, maybe we did that. Yeah. yeah. Um, sometimes, as I said, we get carried away in our treatment, um, not realizing that going beyond the point of futility is not going to help the patient. It may just incur further adverse effects. Now, depression is quite common in schizophrenia. They estimate probably about 30 to 40% of schizophrenic patients at least experience dysphoria, if not outright depression at some point during their illness. Um, you know, understandably, schizophrenia is a, um, a truly awful illness to have. Um, and indeed, it's, its early suicide rate is actually higher than that of major depressive disorder. Uh, it's suspected that a lot of uh, people who have or are undergoing their first psychotic break are at high risk for suicide because, well, it's certainly not a good thing to have your mind begin to do bad things and not function very well. Very good. Okay. So I think we've talked about most areas of this, and I'm, cu I'm curious if there's any other domains in terms of psychotic depression you wanted to cover um, before we sort of bring this to a close. I think the only thing I would add is when people are talking with somebody who they suspect has developed major depression, um, it is prudent clinically to take a close look for specific um, signs and symptoms of psychosis. If you ask too broadly, the person may not answer because indeed they they may be embarrassed by the presence of psychotic symptoms. Um, but as the certain degree of trust begins to evolve, it becomes easier to ask the person about oddities in their thinking, uh, feelings of excessive guilt. Do they blame themselves for things unrealistically? Do they have the experience of seeing or hearing things hallucinating? I, I don't know why sometimes we, we're afraid to ask people if they hallucinate. It's, it's not like most of the public doesn't know what that word means. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've gotten if you ask specific questions you'll get specific answers okay you said blame yourself for something right uh, do you are you blaming yourself excessively for something okay and with no insight that you are not responsible for that thing would you add that yeah. okay yes yeah and you you wouldn't ask that the way that I said it, of course, but it's like, that's what you're thinking as a clinician. Like what's their yeah. level of insight into how they, how responsible they feel. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, you're, you're basically looking for an excessive loss of ability to test reality. Um, now, certainly I think everyone who has major depression, it would be fair to say that their outlook on the world is bleak negative uh, compared to that same person in a euthymic state but if that becomes severe enough it can get to the point that indeed it crosses the boundary into being unrealistic um, and that's that's an area we should probe 
and everyone we meet who is suffering from major depression. Um, I think often the psychotic elements are missed, and it's important not to miss them if they're present because it does alter the treatment response and alters the prognosis. So, okay, treatment treatment algorithm. First, you know, if you think someone is psychotic depressed, my first line would be like an SSRI and an antipsychotic, you know, second generation yes. probably. If they didn't respond, I would think ECT. Yes. How quickly would you go from, are there any other steps that you would do? Of course, I always try to get the people into therapy as well, get them into, you know, exercise. Um, but the severity, if, if it's a very severe depression, psychosis, my success with getting them to do an exercise routine is pretty low. <laughs> so yeah, if they've if they've reached the point where they are hospitalized, we're going to be proceeding fairly quickly to ECT if they fail an antidepressant slash antipsychotic adequate trial, which usually means six weeks at therapeutic doses. Um, or if they're continuing to worsen despite the treatment. Now, if they are outpatient, I may try them on more than one antidepressant slash antipsychotic, give them two trials before proceeding to ECT, uh, depending indeed, again, on how severe the depression is, how much risk they're incurring. Uh, but I, I would not put off proceeding to ECT for a long period of time. I've come across patients who have been on four, five, six, seven trials of antidepressant with or without antipsychotic. And no one's ever thought to move beyond that. And that's not doing the patient any favors because the longer we let illnesses like major depression smolder, the worse the prognosis for achieving a full remission becomes. Yeah, okay. So depending on the level of severity, like if they're hospitalized, you know, would you wait six weeks first move to ECT? Usually if they're hospitalized, they've already been treated with antidepressants. They may yeah. already be on an antidepressant. Yeah, um, if they've already if they've already started treatment and they may be going to ECT fairly quickly, essentially after a review of their history, if they've had at least one adequate therapeutic trial of antidepressant and antipsychotic and they're still ill enough to require hospitalization, and that may be the case where if there are no contraindications, it's, you know, they should proceed fairly rapidly to ECT. And then one other thing I think we, we didn't touch on would be um, if they do look psychotic, if they have depression with psychosis, to definitely consider if they have catatonia as well. Yes. Um, because in my experience, catatonia is pretty close in some of those patients, like they're close to developing, you know, kind of this catatonic, either how they move or repeating words or um, mm -hmm. this kind of immobility stupor. So, yeah, anything else you want to say on that? Um, yeah, I would encourage people to become familiar with the Bush Francis scale for catatonia and just make it a routine part of your workup because we miss a lot of catatonia in hospital settings. Yeah. So in, in the in the Bush Francis catatonia scale, you're rating them from zero to three on things like immobility, stupor. Number two is mutism. Number three, staring. Number four, posturing. Yeah. The advantage of using a scale like that is it reminds you each and every time to do a thorough job of looking for all of the different aspects. Um, because it, 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 it amazes me how often catatonia is missed. And it's mostly just because people don't look. Yeah, it goes all the way. There's 23 different types of symptoms. Check it out. We did an episode on catatonia I'm very proud of. Um, of note, uh, one of the biggest things I've learned, and I'll repeat this over and over again, is you know, they may need a lot of lorazepam and lorazepam itself may be enough. They may, they may not need ECT, right? Yes. If, if they get complete resolution from the catatonia from lorazepam, 
how long do they need to be on that dose of lorazepam? It will vary, but it may be months. It may be months, right? And then one of the things I learned from Dr. Cummings is you only go down about one milligram per month. Yes. And continue to monitor. That is like mind blowing for outpatient care. Like they could be on like 12 milligrams of lorazepam per day, every day for a month, right? And then you go down yeah. to 11. Yeah. Well, one of the, you know, fortunately, one of the causes of catatonia is benzodiazepine withdrawal. Um, so people have to be very careful about the rate at which they reduce the benzodiazepine. Uh, if they go too quickly, they'll just reinduce the catatonia. Um, the other, the other thing I always want to be sure people do correctly is if you're going to do a lorazepam challenge, i.e. test to see if the person's responsive to a benzodiazepine, it should be given IM or IV. Um, an oral dose of lorazepam will typically not achieve a high enough peak to get a response from the catatonic person. So you give the IM, and then you check back in how many minutes? About 30 to 45 minutes. So uh, set, set your timer. You have to set yes. your timer. <laughs> and then take the medical students with you. You know, that was always, it was always like my funnest event to do when I was. Oh, yeah, because it, it's impressive when the person wakes up and looks much more normal than they did yeah take have the medical students see the before have them do the scale right the mm -hmm. experience and then um have them go with you after and and then if 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 it worked start escalating the dose of of lorazepam right and yes. um those <laughs> yeah yeah get them on get them on a high enough dose that actually like gets them out of the the catatonia Okay. All right. Anything else you want to talk about today or anything coming to your mind that you want to share about psychotic depression? No, I think we have pretty much covered it. It's been fun. I think, I think our, our diversions into differentials and sort of like things that cluster together will be helpful. I, I really appreciate you coming on Dr. Cummings as always. Okay. Um, thanks. I've enjoyed it. All right. Have a great day.